Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulina ve Habibina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve ashabihi ecma'in. Allahümme salli ve sellem ala Seyyidina Muhammed. Allahümme salli ve sellem ala Seyyidina Muhammed. Allahümme salli ve sellem ve barik ve en'am ala Habibina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve ashabihi ecma'in. La havle ve la kuvvete illa billah. La havle ve la kuvvete illa billah. La havle ve la kuvvete illa billah. La ilahe illallah. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Uh, assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us again on another episode of The Meeting Point. Um, it's always an honor uh, to have everyone in the audience with us. It's also always an honor to be with my beloved Mashaykh, uh, Sheikh Hussama, um, home in New Jersey, and Sheikh Yasser uh, away in Boston. Um, assalamu alaikum to our Mashaykh. Uh, or at home in Boston, yani. yeah. No, no. Uh, home is New Jersey. <laughs> it will always be New Jersey. So he's away still. He's still traveling. I have, to, I doing, have, to, I have to plead the fifth on that one. He's been doing Jamar and Qasr all these years, and he's still traveling. <laughs> <technically. laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back with everyone. Alhamdulillah. I ask Allah SWT, um, inshallah, bless this, uh, this gathering. That he allows uh, benefit to come from it. That he guides our tongues and our hearts to seek and speak only the truth. And that he guides our hearts to be uh, pure in our intentions, inshallah, that we're all of us, uh, both, uh, the, both of the Mashayikh, myself, and all of our audience are attending and a part of this, uh, are taking a part of, taking part in this gathering purely for the sake of Allah SWT, and that he makes us ibadah and he elevates us all to him uh, on the Day of Judgment through this action, inshallah. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we ventured in very slightly, uh, only as an example, um, into the conversation around the legalization um, of marijuana. Um, and we got a question specific to that episode or after that episode, but it's a question that we've gotten so many times over the years. Um, and so we thought we'd start discussing it today. The question that came to us um, was um, uh, someone had asked us to engage in a conversation around psychedelics and the use of drugs like marijuana um, and others, um, recreational drugs, um, because it's becoming legalized and because the conversation in the country has taken a turn towards normalizing it even further. Um, and so there is a sense, and I think it's a, it's a good sense, that uh, many young Muslims or many not so young American born Muslims especially um, are now overwhelmed with these thoughts. I know I've gotten the conversation many times through our AMAs about, you know, why is it haram? Shouldn't we vote for it to be legalized? Um, you know, what's the big deal if you do it? Um, and I think there is a legitimate concern that, you know, th this is the first step of many to just complete normalization. Um, and, you know, we have a very healthy and strong dialogue around alcohol. Uh, in the religion. And so people don't normally ask about alcohol. They know it's haram. They know, you know, that they should stay away from it. They know the general dangers of it. Um, but it seems like marijuana might be venturing closer to that area where tobacco goes, right? Where there's some conversation around it, but you have a lot of people in the community who might feel comfortable utilizing it and so on. And so there, the question was essentially, can we address the issue of psychedelics and specifically weed um, to kind of give young Muslims are framing about how to understand uh, the substance and its use and abuses um, and so on. And so I, I kind of just want to start off with a general question about it. Um, uh, you know, if you guys have, if, if either or both of the Mashiach have an introductory thought, but also yeah. specifically, what is the general ruling um, on such uh, um, substances in Islam? And, and we'll start with Sheikh Hussam, inshallah. ذاك الخير مولانا سيد الله يحفظك يا رب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. I really think before actually delving into this discussion is very important to make a few distinctions. Um, uh, first off, if you haven't listened to the episode where we addressed the legalization of marijuana, uh, I would recommend listening to it because in that part of the episode it was actually in one of the it was in the end of our segment um uh uh it was about the segment was about voting it was the religion and politics it was a second uh, segment i believe part two uh if you go to that you know we made a detailed distinction between the ruling of mar uh, marijuana use in islam 
and the discourse around its legalization, the different aspects of the discussion to consider in terms of the prison industrial complex and also in terms of profiteering uh, from big uh, corporations on the sale of the, this, uh, this drug. Uh, so we made that distinction, you know, when discussing about it uh, in the political arena and the legal arena. Uh, and, you know, in this episode, we want to focus a little bit more on uh, the religious slash philosophical aspect of approaching this discussion. Uh, that's, I guess, the, the first thing, distinction I would make. And the second distinction I would make is um, a very, very important part of this discussion is uh, one's philosophical approach to uh, the realities of life. I'll put it that instead of saying the challenges of life because uh, it's not necessarily always relating to challenge and struggle, but one's approach to the realities of life uh, on one end. And the other part of the discussion that's also important is for me knowing the halal and the haram, you know, be, me being clear on what's actually allowed and what isn't. There are two important parts of this, and you know, I guess to further clarify what I mean by that exactly is uh, very often um, when people ask about matters of their religion, they want to know the bottom line. Just tell me, can I do it or not? But it's usually not about knowing the bottom line. It's more about one's perspective, one's approach. It makes a big difference, um, uh, you know, with dealing with a whole bunch of things in life, you know, uh, your perspective and your approach on them uh, might be equally important or even more important sometimes than exactly what you're engaging in. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really encourage everyone when you explore the rulings of the dean to consider that, too. It's not just about the bottom line, because something might be allowed, quote unquote, according to the bottom line. But... Um, it's actually very damaging to your life on a philosophical level. It could actually, uh, you know, cause you to fall into many, um, I guess, uh, gray areas, uh, uh, you know, and uh, and so on and so forth. So that's that's another thing to consider. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, discussing the issue at hand, I think inshallah we're going to be addressing uh, both of these uh, both of these parts to the discussion. I just wanted to throw that in as an introduction, Omar. And perhaps uh, off of that, I can share a very quick thought. Um, and it's it's a way that I, I tend to like to uh, use as a framing with regards to these issues. And Sheikh Hussam spoke about it in the language of the bottom line and kind of the uh, perspective and the philosophy. I, I think a, a, a similar framing and language that kind of comes from within you know, the, the hadith tradition is the language of Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. You know, that Islam, Islam teaches us to have a very holistic approach towards dealing with matters of life. And uh, Islam teaches us to usually think through things, um, particularly through these three prisms. You have this idea of Islam being what you do, um, what is halal, what is haram, uh, you know, how you transact, what you buy, what you consume, etc. There's a whole set of Quranic and Sunnah discourse that has to do with the specific things that you do externally with your body. Then Iman is really your ideas, your beliefs, uh, like Sheikh Usama said, your perspectives, your philosophy, your worldview. How do you think about life? How do you think about existence? Um, how do you think about this life and the afterlife? So it's really the thoughts, the big thoughts that govern your behaviors, your conduct, etc. The third is ihsan, which is re the, 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 the pursuit of spiritual excellence, the pursuit of tarbiya, being both inwardly beautiful and outwardly beautiful. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah loves those who are excellent and beautiful in their conduct. And so when we're talking about any topic in life, filtering it through these three prisms of Islam, Iman, Ihsan is very critical to understanding what does Islam as the religion say about something? Because very often, Sheikh Usama noted this, very often people think that when you're asked, what does Islam say? 
then you're asking just about that first question, is it halal or haram? No, but Islam has everything to say about life. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهُ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ You know, that is the book, that there is no fault in it. It is a source of guidance to those who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I hope and pray that we can perhaps think about those prisms while we're uh, journeying into this topic. Um, I guess it says it just one one more thing I'd like to add, um, you know, about uh, the discussion is, uh, you know, uh, uh, we've had a journey uh, in, with this subject of marijuana in particular and about some other, um, uh, you know, f uh, a focus uh, the drugs that help you focus and uh, like Adderall and so some of the uh, some of, we have a journey with uh, people in terms of the types of questions that we receive specifically about marijuana uh, the beginning part of this journey was uh, well say if I um, am experiencing some pain due to medical reasons is it okay for me to take it in that type of situation uh, with the individual asking knowing very well inside that they're having this internal struggle um, uh, because it's very easy to get a prescription uh, on one end and I, might, I know I, I might not necessarily need it, but at the same time, me feeling guilty unless I find a, a sheikh or a religious figure to legitimize what I really want to do. Um, so that's 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 part of the now now we're having and we're entering a new discussion, which is the outright legalization of it. And sometimes some of the points used to legitimize it on a philosophical level are some of the discussion points, you know, uh, about it uh, in terms of, oh, people aren't going to stop using it anyway. Oh, it's a personal choice. Why would religion get involved in this? And, uh, um, oh, uh, people are being, uh, their lives are being ruined because of it being criminalized, uh, legalizing versus decriminalizing, decriminalizing it, uh, criminalizing it. And, uh, you know, so I think, I think that's also important to keep in mind that there was, a, a, you know, a sort of a journey that we had in arriving at where we're at, uh, where at one point people would not even think to ask such a question. But I think the realities of our time, you know, cre create all kinds of crutches for people. And I think that's an important thing to note in this, uh, in this episode. Uh, we're not just talking about drugs. Uh, where the, the subject is about drugs, but it extends into many other things that people use as crutches, uh, like, um, uh, you know, uh, entertainment in general, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, the comedy industry and the entertainment industry and, uh, and uh, I guess the gadgets and the consumerism and, uh, uh, you know, and the material attachments that, you know, are very, very commonly found and the reality we live in today. Barakallah fikum, Sheikh. So I, there's a lot of um, great content I want to like drive in there. Um, but I, I do think, <laughs> I understand everything you just said, but I do think a good place to start um, just to establish the clear boundaries um, is to answer the question from a fiqhi legal perspective first, right? So if, if I'm a young man or a young woman who has access uh, to marijuana legally or illegally right now, and all my friends are smoking it, right? Is it halal for me to smoke marijuana just as a form of entertainment or enjoyment? Or you know, does this, what is Islam's general ruling from a starting point on this? Where are the boundaries? And, and I, I know everything you just said, I completely agree with. But I do think, A, it's important for the framing of the conversation that people understand what we're talking about legally. And then B, I do think there are plenty of people who are listening who are just going to want to know, like, what is this sense perspective? And then they'll open up and hear everything else. Um, but if we don't get to it, I think it'll cause more confusion rather than less. So if you don't mind, um, my beloved Sheikhs, if you can answer that question for us, I think it'll be a good starting point. And then we can drive into you know, some of the bigger points that we want to hit. Shaykh Hussam has, has a lot of books behind him, so he seems like, <laughs> he seems like well, he's more qualified you know, <laughs> to answer this question. I, 
I just have a small painting. I don't really. Oh <laughs> <God. Come on. laughs> can you open one of those books behind you? See, find some. <laughs> <laughs> The, I guess, look, Molana, the, you know, the reason I, uh, you know, we're definitely not, we're not trying to evade the question. Um, uh, the, you know, but uh, I, I hope people can appreciate from uh, some of the episodes that we've had at the meeting point that a lot of the things, uh, a lot of the modern day issues that we face are very involved issues, legally speaking, from an Islamic perspective. They're not black and whites. I could just give you a quick answer of haram, and it's going to leave so many questions and points of contention, then it's actually going to really give answers. Um, so uh, it, a lot of these things are very involved. But again, you know, just to address some of the aspects in it, it's very important to note the following. M my dean wants me to not only consider what I consume, but the way I choose to operate and the place I choose to um, uh, be, the location, the people I choose to engage with. Uh, Islam, there's many hadith that are involved with the concept of shubha and uh, avoiding areas of doubt because of the consequence that might cause socially speaking and the ridges it might cause between the members of society. All of these are considerations because Islam teaches me to spawn from a person, from a place not of individualism, but a place of uh, society, so, so, uh, of, of, uh, of being a member of society, uh, of recognizing that uh, as a member of society, I have a certain duty to maintain the health of society as a whole. When I make decisions as a believer, it's not just for me, myself, and I. It's for the community, for uh, society uh, uh, as a whole. So I think that that's part of the discussion. What, what I mean by that particularly is you'll find certain ahkam uh, in, the, in the books of fiqh that prohibit the idea of a tashabbuh bil fasaqa. Yani it is haram for an individual to liken themselves for, to peop, uh, with people who engage in, um, uh, you know, uh, issues that are far less than ideal in terms of our values, in terms of our character, in terms of our tadayun and iltizam. Uh, you know, even like that concept, we get this question a lot. Is it okay for me to sit on a table that has alcohol in it or to go to a restaurant that has alcohol? I'm not consuming it myself. Why would it even be a question? Because, you know, Islam wants me to consider environment. And that's part of the thing that needs to be considered when I choose to uh, associate with people who take marijuana or to go to places where uh, it's consumed or uh, to, um, uh, you know, even, even uh, from the consumption standpoint uh, of, you know, who that makes me similar to as a person. I should consider that. So that's one part of the discussion. And then the other, th the other part of the discuss discussion is actually what it is often linked with. So that's why it's a very involved discussion. Like uh, it's often, like you said, it's an entry point. There's a lot of studies done about it being an entry point drug uh, to other drugs. And I know that's going to be, uh, people are going to contend that. And also there's, uh, there's a discussion about uh, what it does to your mind, um, how it, it inhibits your mind. Some people are going to say, well, no, it enhances your focus. So I don't take it in these crazy amounts. So, you know, so the discussion around uh, what would happen to at least some of the members of society uh, if uh, marijuana becomes commonplace in their life, if it dominates their life, what happens? Is it, so, what is it, is it associated with? So that's why you see like the, the considerations are, you know, so vast that's like even like when i get that question about uh me being in a relationship you know well uh, you know like or being a you know i guess um um uh, you know if you know why would it be haram for me to be in uh 
you know, casual relationship with a person of the opposite gender, uh, as long as I don't go fall into doing something haram, uh, I know myself, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. Well, I know if I take marijuana, I'm going to take it in small amounts, and I'm not going to do what these other people are doing in terms of uh, it completely derailing their life. See, yeah. that's, that's, that's why... Uh, this is an extremely involved issue. <laughs> I, I understand, but if, if I if I can press a little bit, then Sheikh, right? Like there's, based on everything you just said, wh what it seems you're leading up to is that the substance in itself, which is like, this is actually new to me, right? The substance in itself may not be haram, but it's surrounding no, I'm uh, not culture is not haram, right? Oh, I'm, no. I'm saying that, that like that. The answer that you're giving right now, or the, the 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 conversation that you went into, that seems to be what you're building up to. Whereas, like something like alcohol, the starting point is the substance itself is clearly haram, mm -hmm. right? Everything else around it, there's still a conversation around it about like, okay, what what if I'm just around it but not consuming it, right? Zina is by itself clearly haram, right? The so the question about having a casual relationship is kind of like, okay, well, I'm not falling into the clearly haram. Right. Why is this other stuff then haram? Right. So are, am I understanding the point that you're getting to that marijuana might not be haram in and of itself, but no. the surrounding culture makes it haram? No, Zakala khair for making that distinction. No, that is just uh, it's one it's one consideration. The other consideration is the substance itself. So the first consideration, everything I've been talking about is the surrounding culture. Right. The second consideration is a substance itself. There's two things in it: THC, CBD. Uh, uh, the the you know two main components that the discussion often revolves around. People uh, people say that oh there's a lot of benefits in CBD and hemp oil or uh, uh, You know why would it be problematic? Um, uh, the answer to this question is the the bigger problem is in THC, which is the psychoactive in marijuana. And that's what actually, uh, you know, impairs in some ways your mind, uh, even if not immediately, um, uh, but it does impair the mind and it affects it in a way. And that's why as a psychoactive, it's addictive. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's, the, that's the element in it that it's very, that's very haram. Uh, that's, uh, you know, and again, I know people are going to try to contend that point about it being addictive, uh, but the psychoactive in it that makes it haram is the THC. And uh, this is an opinion that's uh, held by many scholars and many fiqh assemblies out there. And uh, the, there's no doubt, the, the, usually the question in the fiqh assemblies is, is it okay to use it, um, you know, uh, uh, for medical purposes? And then what's the extent of that? And what's the potential of that leading to addiction beyond the scope of its medical use? That's usually the discussion had. But yeah. about using it for leisure and fun and entertainment, that's that's off the table to begin with because of mm -hmm. it being a psychoactive, uh, of, of it ha having a psychoactive, uh, the, which is the THC. Mm -hmm. exactly. so, haram. Uh <laughs> well, I so I'm going to go to Sheikh Asr, but I do want to I, I want to like highlight a, a reason why I press that right. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times, so I, I fully understand and appreciate the the whole conversation that you and Sheikh Yasser started with, and that Inshallah we'll go back to, which is that this is a much larger everything in Islam is a much larger conversation than just the fiqh um, of it. But the fiqhi position or the fiqhi ruling on a specific matter does adjust how you handle the, even the wider conversation, All right? So something being clearly haram uh, changes how you're going to handle everything around that thing versus something that's like, you know, it's it's haram not because of itself, it's haram because of other circumstances, or it's haram because of something else around it, or it's haram because of a third consideration, right? So the, the way you're then going to uh, sort of manage how you handle that thing changes drastically. And that, uh, that's why I was asking the question, like you seem to be building up to an answer that was really actually like, I was genuinely kind of like, what, what, what that kind of like, that's new to me. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know that it's the haram for itself. Right. So, but it, it, you, you correct, I, you corrected my understanding that no, no, it is haram for itself, but there's a much wider conversation here about uh, what else is wrong with it? Yeah, I, th I think if I'm going to psychoanalyze Sheikh Hussam's answer, <laughs> but in the, not from the perspective of, um, I think Sheikh Hussam, like many Shiuch, all of us uh, are, 
we're, we're answering a lot of the questions that people pose around this issue while we're answering and we're trying to give the framing that will appease kind of people's concerns or interests because there's one there's, there's today especially around marijuana which usually revolves around you you don't really understand what the nature of marijuana is the full components and so like i hear what you're saying but you know and 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 and, and so th there is a quality to this conversation that people have skepticism around the extent to which you actually um, fathom all of the components of the whole marijuana discourse, right? And um, I think it's, it's important for people that when they're thinking about questions of Islamic legality, fiqh, um, and you see that the scholars, especially a lot of the bodies of scholars, whether it's AMJA or Fiqh Council of North America, um, and many other bodies that exist nationally and internationally, when, when the general consensus amongst those bodies, after doing their laborious work, and there are papers that they've produced, okay, they haven't just, they've spoken to medical experts, they've spoken to, you know, substance experts, these are people who've actually done the research. And when they synthesize that, and these, by the way, many of these groups don't come from the same exact, I would say, ideological leaning, right? Some may be of, you know, of various persuasions. Uh, they may, you know, have a, a different perspective on some elements of fiqh, but when there's a consensus amongst them, then as, a, as an average Muslim, you know, I really have to learn to defer. And, you know, we, we very often have a tendency to, to force our subjectivity on the matter. It's like, no, 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 but you don't understand. Like, as I fully am immersed in some realm where I've been around people who smoke and who consume and whatever, I don't see that there's any of the stuff that you guys are talking about. Like Sheikh Osama was saying, it enhances it, it whatever, it relaxes, but doesn't, it's not like alcohol. No, you can't say it's like alcohol. But fiqh is a very nuanced question, right? It's a question of, 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 of the legal process of how we take mustahdathat, modern substances, how we assess them, what we look at them for, the qualities, where the sharia ah references these types of substances in the particularities around the aql, because the aql is a very sacred reality that sharia ah preserves from the maqasd of sharia ah is this idea of hifdul aql, the preservation of the intellect. And so there's a lot that goes into the process that arrives at the opinion that Sheikh Hussam articulated, which is that the consensus of scholarship is that THC, the psychoactive quality in marijuana, is prohibited in Islam. And there's no distinction between al-qalil wal kathir, whether it's small in amount or a large in amount, because ma, 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 you know, that which in its abundance brings a type of impact, فَقَلِيلُهُ haram, right? So we have... It, there is a process here and these people who are coming to these rulings they're doing it within a methodical way that as as the commoner muslim i have to develop far more trust even if i'm not convinced okay and conv being convinced is not a precondition for you to listen to your scholarship I, I want to put that a little bit bluntly, to be honest. Like people think that everything is about, well, you know, you know, convince me. I, I, you don't have to be convinced because people don't, they don't, they, they don't know the extent of what, you know, Sharia, how it operates in the fiqh and the details. And I'm not saying take my word for as Yasser Fahmi or take Sheikh Usama's word for it. You may not like me. You may not like Sheikh Usama. That's fine. Right. But when you have bodies of scholars, well, it's hard not to like Sheikh Hussam. It's, it's very easy to not to like me, but Sheikh Hussam, you know, Sheikh Hussam is, <laughs> mashallah, Ahl al Quran. Um, you know, but, but when you look at the bodies of scholarship, then I would say for everyone, you know, when the scholars are saying THC is haram based on all of the factors considered, then we say khair, inshallah, you know, and then we can have, then, like, like Sazed Zaid is noting, then we can have a conversation about. You know how it kind of operates in our lives, how we think about it, how we process it, etc. Yeah, um, Maulana, the, and if I could add just uh, two things about that, like the, uh, yani, 
I, I it's important to understand the following about haram like you said uh, haram they categorize haram that which is prohibited to two categories uh, the haram li nafsi wa haram li ghayri like you said but both fall under haram yani so whether you say it's because of the surrounding culture or because of this both are constituents of haram yes one degree of haram is higher than the other uh, the that which is haram li is a greater muharram that would only be allowed in case of darura like that you know, if you're uh, you know a case of uh, uh, absolute necessity where your life depends on it or something of the sort uh, and uh, the haram li ghayri uh, would be a lesser level, but still under haram. It's haram. It's prohibited. And there's a there's a qaida that they say, and um, uh, in the books of uh, fiqh, uh, the qawaid fiqhia is lil wasail hukm al maqasid. You know, the means take the rulings of their ends. You know, uh, so that consideration is in fiqh. The surrounding culture, everything that's surrounding it, when a ruling is decided. In our deen, it's not because of Zaid, Fatima, or Amr. It's because of what it will collectively lead to. Uh, our deen is spawning from the impact, the societal impact. Not from the individual impact necessarily. And that's the same thing. The other part of this discussion that's very important in legal speaking, legally speaking is, um, uh, you know, uh, as some people might make the argument, well, they might even make the same argument with alcohol, even though the, the, the numbers would be far less. That, all right, well, what's the big deal? I know that uh, the reasoning behind the prohibition of alcohol is because it leads to uh, family problems, it leads to commission of crimes, it leads to loss of life, uh, like we see in those, uh, um, uh, you know, drunk driving accidents and all the rest. Well, we see that, I understand that. But what's the big deal? If I have a few sips of wine after I come home from work, I'm not getting drunk and I know how to control myself. And so, but the point here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this reality in the Quran. Uh, the Quran recognizes the reality that there are some health benefits that people can argue uh, with wine. They could say, oh, it's good for your heart. Oh, it's good for this. It's good for that. Um, uh, you know, but Allah Azza wa Jal says, gives us the ruling, the end ruling, uh, that the harm in them is far more abundant than the benefit. And in the end, as a believer, I know that Allah Azza wa Jal, as al-hakim, is the one who decides what is hasan and what is qabih. He decides what is pleasant and what is uh, wicked, just like Sheikh Yasser said in that hadith right now. Uh, that which is causes sukr and intoxication in large amounts would also be haram in small amounts because husn and qubuh, that which is pleasant and that which is wicked, is taken from shara, from revelation. Allah I think what Sheikh Usama is ultimately indicating here is that even when you're just having the conversation around fiqh. It's fiqh, fiqh itself is not divorced from the greater context of um, these issues. So there are, if you read the fatawa that are written about these questions, they don't just talk about the nature of the substance and the, the type of qiyas, uh, the analogical reasoning that's done to assess, you know, how, what can we liken marijuana to in the sharia, in Islam, in the Quran, in sunnah, etc., which is very often it is likened to um, that which inhibits the mind <clears throat> but you're also talking about the the real potential familial social ramifications um, how this impacts society at large so that the fuqaha the fuqaha who are the scholars of islamic law will factor in the broader ramifications right and those discussions are essential to understanding the full extent of the legal discourse around marijuana. And I think that's what, in, in, in very small summary, that's what Sheikh Hussam is indicating. So don't, when you're thinking about the question of legality in Islam, you're not just thinking about like, well, I have this very subjective idea about this issue, which is, it's not that big of a deal. Like, why are you so uptight? You know, why are you thinking, it's just, it's just marijuana. It's not that big of a deal. 
right? I want to get to that statement in of itself because, you know, that's a big part of the philosophical conditioning of our age around this question. But it's, you know, as a commoner, I have to listen, I have to realize, no, there are multiple factors that are being considered for the scholars to ultimately say, this is haram. I hope that, you know, clarifies. Yeah, you know, I, I keep laughing as you guys are speaking because a lot of times, in my experience, people who make those type of comments about the scholars um, are people themselves who have absolutely no real clue what they're talking about. And I don't mean to like dis like <laughs> put like disparage anyone from our audience, but there's a lot of people like on this topic specifically who might listen to some podcasts, you know, that really promote uh, the use of psychedelics or, uh, you know, they might have some very minuscule understanding of what they are from like a friend or some Wikipedia article or some Google search that they do or some corporate advertisement um, that they, they read or look at. Uh, but they themselves have never genuinely studied this subject uh, deeply. And then they'll come to the shiyukh or they'll look at what the shiyukh has to say and they'll be like, oh, that guy just doesn't, he just doesn't understand the culture. He doesn't understand what's actually happening right now. Um, and there's this sense almost that from a lot of people who come to this conclusion that if they were to just understand the culture, the immediate natural response would be to change the ruling, right? And there's no consideration given to the fact that no, even when we understand the culture and in many places, because we understand the culture, we're not changing the ruling, we're actually gonna get even more. Um, and it was from the very beginning of Sheikh Osama's answer when he broke down the substances in marijuana. And I know this is something that many of the shiuch do. Uh, you know, I was, extremely pleased to see him do that because I don't think most people ever thought about the question to that level of detail, right? Well, let's actually get down to the substances that are in it so we can sort of clarify what is and what isn't and, and then uh, come to a ruling about it. Um, and so it's, it's always been ironic to me that the very people who criticize the scholars for being out of touch and uninformed are people who haven't done one one-tenth the study or the research or the understanding that the scholars have put in um, whether or not you agree, you, you, like it's very difficult to look at the two positions and not recognize that one of them is extremely informed and studied, and the other one is just kind of culturally, you know, subjective. Yeah, I I, I want to mention just a point of I would call um, decorum or etiquette when thinking about just matters of behavior in life. Uh, one of the one of the modern realities that have been constructed is that the person views themselves almost like as a small independent authority where our individual opinions have become so exaggerated about like their veracity and their like you know validity and equality because there is this idea of the individual and your yourself and your autonomy and your self-worth and so there's a lot of you know thinking that you know my opinion really does matter in this discourse and I don't, it's not, it's not, uh, I'm actually not saying this to belittle uh, people's opinions. No, but there, there is, there is a, a real point um, that I think we all have to come into far deeper familiarity with, which is the duty of Islamic scholarship for over 1400 years has been very simple, has been trying to discover and uncover and understand what is expected of us. So there's a very, I would call subservient disposition to Islamic scholarship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who al khaliq he created. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is al-hakim, he's the all-wise, he is al-alim, the all-knowledgeable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the omnipotent, Allah is the all-merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, the all-just. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah, right? With all of these names and these attributes. And then he decreed and he revealed and he commanded. And Islamic scholarship tries to do one thing. It tries to understand, Ya Allah, khitab al Ya Allah, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to be? And just as a disposition, that is unfortunately a far cry from where we are today, which is the natural discourse of the average person is no longer, Ya Allah, what do you want me to do? Sheikh Osama noted this. The average discourse is, you know, why? I want to do this. Why? That doesn't make sense. Why? And, and that shift in the logic and the approach is also in and of itself a deviation 
from the standard, from the norm, because Allah brought us into existence and Allah will remove us from existence. And the day of judgment, he's going to ask us, why did you do and what did you do and, and how did you do it and what was the rationale you used to do it? Allah's going to question us on everything. And I am not standing on very strong grounds when I say to Allah, Ya Allah, I, um, I thought it was this and I, because I really believed I've, you know, I've been watching and I've been consuming and I've been studying and reading some things. And to be honest, it just, it, it, you know, I, Karam Shiuch, this Shiuch didn't really come into my head. I didn't, I didn't agree with it. And I felt this is what was best. Well, you know, just on basic grounds, that's a very shaky ground to stand on, right? I think it's actually very dangerous ground. You would not take that same approach. None of us would take that same approach if it had to do with our, like uh, the medical field, right? If we were talking about trying to get some insight into, uh, you know, a procedure that we have to do or a medical condition that we have, you know, we're going to defer to the scholars and the people of authority. And, and alhamdulillah, we do have that. I mean, there's a lot of papers that have been written about marijuana from an Islamic perspective. And there's these majama have produced. And so if I just take the disposition to say, Ya Allah, I want to understand what you want me to do. And so where do I go? Well, I go to the people who have far greater knowledge about the Quran and the Sunnah, the fiqh, the legal, the law, the philosophy, the spirituality, so I can get my insights around these questions, right? And that disposition uh, is, a, is not only, it's, it's, it's not only the, the correct disposition, but it's the far safer disposition uh, and I'm, I'm saying this very generously. It is the safer disposition than to, you know, stand in front of a long day of judgment, and just say, hey, I did this because I thought I could do it. There used to be a television personality who used to talk about truthiness right, about 10 <laughs> years ago, right? It's not, it's not truth. It's kind of just what feels true to me, right? So <laughs> and no truthiness here in fiqh. Um, yeah, no, and I think but, this, this, even that point that you, go ahead, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Shafi. No, I was going to say that, you know, it's a part of the, 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 you know, the socialization because, you know, you think about marijuana, we've been socialized into normalizing marijuana. It's not some natural thing that we all were born with. And ilam nulad, thinking to ourselves, oh, marijuana, mashallah, is so natural. No, you know, there is, <laughs> there, we've, we've been socialized into this idea. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. you know, the, we've been consuming a lot of culture, a lot of pop culture a lot of discourse, a lot of media, a lot of celebrity, you know, young guys, uh, you know, watching Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan, you know, has completely not only normalized, but like essentialized, like this is just such a better way to live, you know, when you're, yeah. when you're on this substance and, and then, you know, hadith wala haraj, you know, you have the, the likes of Snoop Dogg and, and the, 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 the culture within rap and now not just rap, but multiple like spaces that um, in the music industry, in pop culture, that has said that this is, this is this is like a really nice thing to have in your life. Like you should really introduce a diet of marijuana so that you can enhance your existence and your being. So it's it shouldn't be lost on us as you, as people that there is a social engineering that's taking place, right? And the net result of that social engineering is to normalize, right? It's to normalize this act. Um, <clears throat> so when H Habib is presented with, you know, vodka from from Conor McGregor, right? If you guys remember that 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 image, and he's like, and 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 he says, no, I don't, I don't touch that stuff, right? Very disciplined, very clear, you know, mashallah, with full of izza. And Conor McGregor is like, you know, people are like, what the hell is wrong with you? I'm excuse the, the the bluntness of my language, like, what's wrong with you? You know, you backwards, and he calls him. A bunch of expletives and he calls them you're backwards right you're like what's this is not that big of a deal yeah when you're socialized into believing yeah this is what everyone does and it's not that big of a deal then it's very plausible that internally i begin to hold that opinion that it's not that big of a deal but the question for me always has to go back well where do i refine my ideas and my perspectives where do i understand where do i gain understanding that's why i said it's, it's a source of hidayah. It's a source of guidance. It clarifies truth and falsehood. By the way, there was a lot, I mean, there was a lot of, uh, you know, legal discourse in the early life of the Prophet Sallallahu even in the later life, that was very jarring to the social uh, atmosphere. People did not accept, and, you know, that's why even like, for example, alcohol, 
it came down gradually because the society was so steeped in the idea of of the consumption of alcohol that you know there was a, there was a particular approach to to coming to the finality of its prohibition. Um, but so so it's not Islam. Islam it, it comes to to reform and to better and to bring the best possible wellness into society. It's not just meant to be something on the side where society kind of defines for us what is normal and what is good and what is, you know, what should be status quo. And then like Sharia is this annoying friend on the side who just keeps on like, hey, don't do that. <laughs> you know, Sharia is not some annoying friend on the side that we should dismiss. No, Sharia, you know, gives us insight, guidance, healing, clarity, etc. Allahu Akbar. Zakallah khair Maulana. Yani, um, you know, I think like the conversation shifted to discussing the philosophical aspect of the discussion. You know, so I think the social component, philosophical component, and the Islamic legal component, you know, are the three things we're basically been trying to address in this uh, halaqa. I hope everyone's following along with that. Uh, and uh, you know, I guess to that point, uh, you know, I, I I really think it's so important that people realize the significance of this part of the discussion. How uh, you know, we are like Sheikh Yasser said, socialized into accepting <clears throat> certain things, you know, and they're usually linked with big profits and big corporations. And we've seen it with so many other things, like with smoking with tobacco use, uh, uh, with uh, even in the entertainment industry, normalizing, um, you know, uh, certain perspectives on social issues, uh, you know, the entertainment industry, uh, you know, how it really shapes people's understandings of critical issues, even through movies and through and th shows the, the, the messaging that comes through that in terms of the values in society that's that's a, that's a layer of the discussion that you know i must not lose sight of you know well you know when you have massive amounts of profits in the uh, you know hundreds of millions and billions uh, I, you know <laughs> i should not be duped into just thinking uh, that oh yeah this is this is something that needs to be part of my life because uh, everyone on tv is telling me it's important for me uh, and it's good for me. Uh, so, I, you know, I think that in that regard, the Muslim, the Muslim is actually through our faith trained to be, to have a critical eye. Uh, to where's my maslaha? Where's my benefit? You know, as our prophet وسلم, said, you know, don't be a person who just goes with the flow. And, and, and that's why for me, you know, I think for a lot of people, the philosophical aspect of discussion, this discussion is so much more convincing than perhaps some other aspects, even though in my, in my belief, they're all equally important. They're, they're all very important. But for many people, when someone realizes, you know, uh, how uh, they're really just, um, you know, uh, being used, they're, they're being directed uh, they're being stripped of their critical, uh, their, their, their capacity to critically think uh, when they just choose to follow uh, what everyone else is doing and what the entertainment industry is telling them to do and what uh, everyone in society is, has normalized with. You know? And uh, for, for me, uh, you know, I, think, I think it's really important to consider that when you're approaching this issue. So I, 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 again, I appreciate all the points that you and Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Hassan, Sheikh Samad, that you guys just made. I, I'd want to push back slightly on something when it comes to marijuana right now. Um, and this is just my own personal perspective. Uh, I, you know, marijuana has not yet, um, to date, as far as I know, it has not been backed yet. There's no massive conglomerate, corporate conglomerate right, that is making billions upon billions of dollars of profit off this thing and has, has come to run it the way the alcohol industry is. Um, you're looking at me very strange, but I'm, I'm unless I'm mistaken. I mean, that's all, it's like, it's, a, I mean, we're already talking about billions of dollars. It's like, no, I mean, no. maybe it's not, maybe it's not, maybe it's not as mainstream as alcohol, but there's a lot of money. No, no, there's made. a lot of money, but um, to, to present, so the point I was trying to get to. Sorry. I, um, yeah, so. Like when it comes to alcohol, for example, right? Since we keep going back and forth with that comparison, there are massive legal, hugely powerful businesses, corporations, entities, right, that make 
a lot of profit off of it. And so, yes, they're going to keep trying to push it um, into mainstream culture, right? Uh, that hasn't existed yet for marijuana in America, right? There, there isn't this legal recognized body of, of you know, entities that have lobbyists that are descending upon Washington and are pushing things. I, I, I disagree a hundred percent. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> like that, that's exactly what's happening. Uh, okay. I, I will stand corrected on that. Cause I have not seen that. Cause no, I mean, the, the why, reality why, of why, marijuana why, in, our, in my lifetime, the reality of marijuana has been that it has been under the radar. It's been hugely popular. It's been very, very much used, but on the street <laughs> it has not been, through these very powerful legal entities, right? And the reason why I bring that point up is that many people may look at that and understand that this is a far more um, organic thing, right? Yes, it, it's, it's something that I may be genuinely, um, it's seeping into my life because it's all around me, right? But this is a far more organic thing than what alcohol is today, right? And one could even go far enough back in time and say there's a far more, like alcohol at one point was very organic too, right? I mean, at the time of the Sahaba and the Rasulullah sent them, it wasn't like they were the huge conglomerates at the time that ran everything, right? Like it was a part of the culture for, uh, for other, perhaps more organic <coughs> reasons, right? <clears throat> the real point I'm trying to jump to though, right? Out of that whole conversation, if I'm mistaken, Jazakumullah khair for clarifying it for me and I'll look into those details, right? No, no, no. But, I, yeah. I, I cannot, I'm sorry, but I, if, yeah. I, if I may, and I, excuse me for, for cutting you off. Or, no, go, you go know, right ahead, Chef. I, don't, I didn't mean to, to be so uh, crass about it, but uh, uh, no, I, I think um, there is, uh, without a doubt, um, there is um, huge lobbying firms now that have been, uh, that are fully operating within the political space there's a reason why it's a uh, it's a bill, uh, mm -hmm. and it's 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 considered in every like, every election cycle. It's being considered on the ballot somewhere in this country. That is not some natural, uh, you know, movement from within the masses. There are absolutely 100% verified. They can even bring you the lobbying firms, who ensure and and who are being paid to bring this as a legal question, as a social issue, as it is. <clears throat> you know, you, Zaid, you and I, we grew up in the same exact era. We grew up in the 80s and yeah. the 90s. Yeah. And we certainly did not see at 1 100th uh, of, of, of what we did, the organization and, and the essentialization of, the essentializing of marijuana in every aspect of our life, in the political life, in the social life. It's being tied into all these other questions, etc. So, I mean, I, I think no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a with you there. Clear indication. Then the big business is funding these efforts. I mean, and, and the, the lines. I mean, I don't, I don't have the names off the top of my head. But like I said in the last time, you know, I, I've been, I've been in gatherings with with politicians, with legal experts, with constitutional uh, lawyers who are who are who are who've been analyzing and, and and watching the trajectory of this question as a political issue, and then the social ramifications. The tentacles of, of, of special interest groups are deeply embedded within this space. And it's, it's the reason why we see it everywhere. It's the reason why we have, <clears throat> like you come to Massachusetts now, because it's been legalized here for four years, since I first came here over five years ago, it's been legalized and uh, billboards everywhere, C CBD shops and THC shops and people buying and, and, and using the e-cigs and, and using all like the substance and the bill big billboards with the marijuana leaf. And I mean, it, it's, it's much more than just like what you said when we grew up. Yeah, it was like, I remember when I was in high school because I went to Catholic school. Um, I, I mean, this stuff would be, you know, like a blunt would be passed normally after, after, I mean, it's not because I went to Catholic school, this stuff was happening. I mean, it happens <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> like, I don't want to say, by the way, I went to Catholic school, so therefore, but I remember, I mean, I grew up watching drugs pass in front of me. I mean, I, just to be clear, like I saw baggies of marijuana. I even saw, you know, heroin because, you know, some of these guys at school, they were coming from cultures where heroin and cocaine were the drugs that they consumed, um, you know, and, and so, yeah, it was far more about the subculture. It was the hush, hush, you know, kind of passing it on the thing. But it's reality. Yeah, but, but I understand. I, I understand that. But I, I think that was the point I was trying to like come to was 
when maybe I should have just jump right into the point so that I didn't confuse anything, but I guess that's good because I, I think you, you know, you, you, your point was um, there's an exclamation point on the idea that it's being, you know, pushed unnaturally at this point. From my but, perspective. Yeah, from your perspective. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another point that maybe I'll get to later on the, in the conversation. But, you know, when you talk about social engineering, right, and you use terminology like that, especially when it comes from the religious perspective, there's a tendency from people to look at and say, well, you're like, this is just like religious people always think that there's some conspiracy against and Muslims, especially, I mean, uh, uncles in, in the Muslim community are very famous for, for this, right? There's always some conspiracy against Islam. There's some, they know that if Islam becomes, you know, if it's open and it's out there, it's going to rule everything. And so people look at with a very skeptical eye at this idea of terminology like that, that there's some conspiracy, there's social engineering, um, oh no! Conspiracy and social engineering are two different terms. I understand. I'm okay. saying that when, when you use terminology like that and you discuss it in that way, I I, I worry that people look at the conversation um, yeah. or misunderstand what the conversation that we're getting at. Right. So the point that I was trying to get to with my whole thing about like, well, marijuana didn't have that trajectory in my lifetime. It didn't have that trajectory of being introduced from this inorganic thing. No, it was there. It's always been there, you know, since I was a kid, it's been there, even when it was illegal, even when it wasn't being discussed openly, even yeah. when it was considered in popular culture as something really bad, right? It was still there. And so someone may come and say, well, it's not really being forced down people's throats. This is something that people naturally are enjoying and they're benefiting from, right? When, when the podcaster that you mentioned or artists that I like to listen to or sports figures tell me that they're smoking it and it helps them, this is not coming from a place of them, like they're not trying to manipulate me, right? They're giving me a perspective, right? So it's not like I'm being forced on this, right? And I, I, I wanted to highlight that point, not to like push back, but to say that I think what's re what I think the shiuch are really trying to get to is when we allow ourselves to be overwhelmed with the consumption of just culture and we do not engage in a healthy diet of uh, studying the Quran, studying the life of the Prophet them, and making that our primary uh, source of education and, and like uh, growth, we're always going to end up in this state of confusion. Because yeah, this weed may have been a very organic thing to grow in, in the 20 years that I've, that I've been an adult, right? It, it, it doesn't seem to me that it was forced on people. It became popular and then it gained some power, like there were powerful groups that grew out of it, not the other way around, right? But that doesn't change the fact that if all I do is consume culture, I may be easily duped into seeing the world in one way and completely then writing off the way that Allah SWT wants me to see it. That, that's the point I was trying to get to. Yeah, right? that, uh, yeah. no, a point taken, Zakallah khair, uh, uh, Ustaz Zaid for that, Barakallah Fiqh, uh, but um, you know, again, it's not about being forced, uh, you, know, uh, you know, there's a big difference between manipulation and, uh, and force. Uh, the, I guess the best, best type of manipulation is the, manipula the manipulation that leaves the person really thinking that this is their uh, choice, that this is what they want for themselves. You know, there's, you know, the, the, the Sunnah actually describes this reality of us being influenced naturally through our surroundings. You know, the Hadith says that, you know, every single one of us, we come into this dunya with a clean palate. We don't know religion. We don't know social concepts and ideas and values and all the rest. But our parents uh, make us either uh, Muslim or Christian or Jew or something of uh, something else, you know. So that idea of coming with a clean palate and then being influenced and uh, indoctrinated by society is exactly what we're talking about. It's not about being forced, but the manipulation that happens at that level with social engineering is you become indoctrinated into accepting a certain reality and you think it's your own. But in actuality, if you break out of that, you will see that there is a great deal of exploitation happening for the purpose of prof profiteering by, you know, big industries and uh, by people who are, you know, seeking great profit and, uh, and in the name of capitalism, even if that means uh, it's to the society's detriment. 
even if it means it's gonna, you know, take a lot of lives uh, and uh, and uh, cause a lot of del uh, damage and socially and in, in terms of health and all the rest, you know. No, no. I I think he, I think some you know productive questions in that vein is to even ask oneself like why is this an issue that takes up so much space? Like why am I thinking about this all the time? Why am I made to think about this? You know, why is this even a motivation? At the end of the day, this is something that has to do with consumption, something that I'm going to smoke or eat or, you know, what is this really such a moral interest or concern of mine? Why does it occupy so much space? And why is it because I am wanting it to occupy so much space? Or is it because it's I'm being pummeled by it in everywhere I turn that this is something you should occupy yourself with. Listen, targeted marketing. This has been studied for yeah. decades. We are targeted. You know, you look at the nature of how social media functions and how data is bought and sold and the whole idea of curating for the consumer, uh, a set of images and perspectives and ideas you're being enticed here. Look at this. You're going to like this. You may like this. You may consider this. You may want this, right? Boom, all constantly in your face. You literally just say, you know, X, and then suddenly you find an, uh, uh, an advertisement in front of you. These are not like conspiracies. Yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> sure are... we're all going to be overwhelmed with. Uh, yeah, with and we already are. We're, 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 we're like, we're, we're, yeah. we're, 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 we're drowning in this reality. And this is not, this is not really a question of conspiracy. This is a reality because it's a very there's very simple questions that you can ask like what what is my hem what is my concern when when i find that if i step back step back and i look at that most of my interests and my concerns are attached to something that has to do with self pleasure and self joy and self interest i'm not coming from a deeply like prophetic quranic space i'm coming from a deeply shahwani nafsani reality and that we are in the, in, in the modern system, we are, uh, we are uh, products. We, we are, we, you know, we are, we are meant to people like the, the, the way nature and how the modern world works today is like, how much are you going to buy yeah. and how much are you going to consume? How much are you going to sell? Like how productive are you going to be in the marketplace to ensure that there's, you know, generation of money? Like, cause th this is, you know, when, when every single young person, now the target marketing because you know basically they gave up on the previous generation right because like the older people who grew up in a particular context is like you know there's already that stigma that discourse that narrative around marijuana for younger people that's a it's a fresh new batch it's a fresh new crop right uh it far easily because of the nature of how like the pervasive nature of social media and how almost ever present it is um and the nature of media consumption in the modern world our relationship with technology so much easier to present you constantly with images that ultimately become your concern and your interest. This is not like, this is not um, a novel concept. This is just what, you know, why do you think the Sahaba, when they would walk into the marketplace, they would close their ears and they would look down because they knew that their eyes and their ears and their senses were easily manipulated by circumstances. And this is a big point that Sheikh Hussam, I think, was trying to indicate earlier. Like you're, what you look at, what you consume, what you hear, all of that ultimately does have an imprint. It imprints something on you inwardly, right? The beauty of Islam is that came to liberate yourself from yourself, to say that, no, you can, you can choose to live a far, far higher uh, quality and orientation in life than what's just simply presented to you as a status quo, right? If a, if, if a couple of hundred years ago, it was... You know, what kind of uh, horse did you have? <laughs> and, uh, you know, what kind of, you know, uh, access to some basic whatever did you have today? It's, it's what kind of car do you have? And what kind of, you know, things can you eat and drink and consume? How can you find ultimate pleasure and joy? I mean, these are you, when you when you're able to manipulate the nafsani quality of the human being, you can put them into such a bestial state where all they want to do is Consume, 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 pleasure, 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 joy, 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 joy. And that is very convenient for, for, for entities and systems that want to control and dictate. Because if, if every person, like think about your average person today, what do they actually do other than sit down and consume? Like you can sit down and say, oh, it's like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's, it's harmless. But when every single person 
is, you know, has some really comfortable thing to sit on. And they, they, they play video games, they watch TV, they watch Netflix, they consume substances. And it's all just to kind of like get your mind flowing into some, you know, relax, calm down, you know, t- t- wind down at night. Who is that benefiting? Is that benefiting me and my akhirah? Is that benefiting Islam? Is that benefiting the project of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be a mercy to the worlds, right? These are the bigger questions that Islam teaches us to ask about. You know, when Rabbi ibn Amr said, جِئْنَا لِنُخْرِجَ الْعِبَادْ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الْعِبَادِ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ We came to exit people from the worship of, of, of servants to the worship of the Creator, of, to, the, to, the, to the Lord, عِبَادَةُ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ The Lord of servants. وَمِنْ جَوْرِ الْإِدْيَانِ إِلَىٰ عَدْلِ الْإِسْلَامِ And from the, you know, the, the, the transgressive nature of different pathways to the justice, to the just and balanced nature of Islam. And from mindiq dunya ila si'at dunya wal akhirah, and from, from the, 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 the constraint and the tightness of this world to the expansiveness of the, the afterlife, right? So Islam is a, is a liberating reality and it, and it purifies the mind, it purifies the heart. That's why this discussion about a substance that in some capacity certainly influences your mazaj, your mood, your behavior, how you think, how you feel, right? It certainly has that impact. I don't think anyone disagrees. Why do you want to consume it? Just because you like you like to? No one just wants to consume it because they like to smoke, uh, you know, some sort of uh, f- a plant. <laughs> you know, it's like okay, go, you know, smoke weed, uh, like actual actual weed. No, <laughs> smoke, you know, nah, nah, <laughs> smoke mint, <laughs> right? Smoke. No, people want this because it does something. It clearly impacts something. It does something to me. Right? Why, why would I even want that? Why would I want some external substance to impact me? Right? Is that a natural thing, or is it is it is it, it an unnatural uh, reality? These are questions that at least help us start to make more critical decisions about, you know, what I really choose to concern myself with, and ultimately have in my life. Zakallah khair, Sheikh Yasser, Barakallah fiq. I guess, you know, um, uh, adding to that, you know, just the whole concept of entertainment and leisure, leisure in general, the role it plays um, for us on an emotional level is something that we really need to, you know, consider and like really re- reflect on a little bit. Um, we cannot really divorce this discussion about psychedelics, about marijuana, from the discussion about um, the emotional wounds that are so rampant in the lives of people today. There's a lot of emotional damage due to so many different factors. And I know, um, Stad Zaid, you know, b- before the episode, you told me, you know, that many people might say, well, I'm not taking it because I'm emotionally damaged. I'm not taking it because of certain conflict that I'm dealing with in my life. But, you know, I really think to consider and examine at a deeper level um, the way I choose to use my free time, the, uh, what do I do in my leisure? How do I entertain myself? I remember Sheikh Yasser um, a number of years ago recommended that I read a book, uh, uh, Laughing Ourselves to Death, you know, about uh, the entertainment amusing. industry. Entertaining, amusing ourselves to death. Amusing, ourselves, Amus- to death. amusing ourselves to death about the entertainment mm-hmm. industry. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of the times... This discussion is revolving around the the need for a crutch. A person needs a crutch because um, I cannot, I'm just, everything in my reality is pushing me to this attitude where I am looking for escapes. I just want, I don't want to deal with what I have at my hand. I just want some time to just completely disconnect because it's just, sometimes things are just too much to deal with. Uh, you know, I, I got stressed because of this and anxiety because of that and problems with this and, uh, you know, frustration with that is just so much more convenient to uh, escape from that and entertain myself in different ways um, that will give me some release that I'm looking for. You know, and I think uh, there was a, there's a very interesting video I saw um, uh, about, the heroin addiction uh, and its relate, relate its relation to um, you know I guess the the presence of a social support system 
and uh, how what we're really dealing with with some of these drugs uh, is a, a crisis of disconnection. People have disconnected from each other. There's no longer quality human relationships in many people's lives. Some people, uh, they might have some good he relationships with individuals. Others, you know, might not have that outlet at all. And how a lot of the times having a good, healthy social framework is actually the best solution to a lot of those issues people deal with. You know, the presence of a support system is something that we need to work towards. That, that needs to be in place socially. It's far more impactful than having some type of drug that'll give me a release for a period of time before I have to go back to my quote unquote wretched reality and deal with the, uh, you know, all, all of the stress that comes my way. Allah I mean, I, um, the point that you made, Sheikh Hussam, I, I don't know how to pronounce the author's name, but there's a book called Chasing the Scream uh, by Johan Haidt, uh, like H A D T, I think is the way he spells his last name. And he spends quite a bit of time talking about how different countries responded uh, to the drug epidemics. And that is a big point that he makes. From what I understood from my reading of that was uh, the support system plays a very important role in giving someone a purpose and meaning. Right? And that, so if you don't have meaningful relationships, like for people who don't have a meaningful relationship with Allah, and I, I'm saying this now for me, if you don't have that meaningful relationship with Allah, in most people's lives, the next most powerful thing is a relationship that revolves around family and loved ones and those that are very close to you, right? Because it gives you something outside of yourself to commit to. It gives you a much greater purpose in life. And so it gives you a direction. It gives you a heading. Um, and there is an epidemic of loneliness that I, I don't think anybody um, would deny, right? Um, uh, and so I, I, there's a bunch of questions I did want to ask, but I, I'll, I'll stick there because that's where we are in the conversation right now. Um, you know, what would your advice be then? Like if someone's listening to us right now and, and they were to say like, look, whether or not I'm being manipulated and whether or not, um, uh, or like whether or not I'm being manipulated, I, I find that this is something that calms me, right? Or I find that I really am struggling with a sense of anxiety or a sense of loneliness, um, or a sense of uh, pain, whatever it is, right? And I just, it helps me to take time off at the end of my day or at the end of my week and just completely forget about the world. And this helps me do that, right? Okay, I, I shouldn't do it. What would you advise? Like, what, where do I begin, um, you know, staying? Like, what else can I do to keep myself away from it? I, I, I mean, <clears throat> Bismillah. I would say it's it's important to realize first that, you know, I'm a spiritual being, right? We're all spiritual beings. And we have this capacity to feel and to love. We have this capacity to explore, you know, in a spiritual space, like profound meaning. And, you know, the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about sacred revelation, he calls it shifa, you know, and he calls it nur calls it healing and he calls it light and he calls it a source of clarity because as a spiritual being i'm never going to not only just satiate my emotional and spiritual needs through uh you know substance and things like that but you know i, I i'm i'm going to i'm not only gonna sorry i'm not only gonna satiate myself through the quran and the sunnah and find the clarity and find the healing no i'm going to liberate myself and I'm going to be able to go far beyond, you know, the confines of the dunya, right? So, you know, Zayd was noting that we take a lot of times these things because we're looking to just relax, to, to just, you know, wind down, to forget about the world, to just go into my, my space and just, you know, go into my car, go hang out with some friends and just, you know, shoot the breeze and do nothing and not think about my stress, not think about my problems, not think about my issues. And, and that type of escapism, right, or that type of desire for, like, absolute leisure and comfort, um, <clears throat> we are capable as human beings to do far more in our lives. And we shouldn't be reduced to some, like, barely functional entity that needs to be constantly pumped with things just to, like, stand up straight. I mean, we, we, we cannot believe that about ourselves because that's not who we are. You know, when you look 
uh, the transformative quality of Islam in the lives of the early companions. And, and many, you look at the story of Malik ibn Dinar, you know, who was, who was a, a, a drunkard and who was someone who was committed and who was so addicted to substance. And, you know, the night that he had his, his like, if you will, spiritual awakening, it was in a night when he went into like a, a you know, a bender, as they call it, right? That he really was, he binge drink, drank until he was, he went inebriated, he went dark. And, 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 you know, and that was the point of, of, of in his dream where he realized uh, that a shift has to happen in his life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him this image of, you know, this, this uh, dream of his daughter and revelation. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, running, being chased after by a serpent. You can read, this is a beautiful story that you can read. But the point is that he was a known drunkard. And when he had a taste of, the, of, of uh, some exposure to revelation, right, to go um, to that which, is it not time for those who believe that their hearts are, are, are find tranquility in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is in the remembrance of Allah that the heart finds uh, finds you know, tranquility and ease. Then in, 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 when he tasted that, it was like an entryway. <laughs> it was a gateway <laughs> to <laughs> the rest of, of the profundity of the Quran and the Sunnah. And so, Sheikh Usama mentioned this idea of ihras ala ma yanfa'u, which is a prophetic conception. Be keen on that which brings you benefit. We constantly have to be people who look at how to find benefit in my life. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been so generous to me by sending me down revelation, bringing it to me and making it very accessible, and this revelation, it reveals it exposes me, it shows me the truth and reality, then that gives me an opportunity to start tapping into my deeper spiritual self so I can thrive. So I can not only you know, function, I can thrive in this world and I can be by the grace of Allah. Allahumma hadina wa hadibina, oh Allah guide me and guide through me. I can be, a, I can, Prophet was a mercy to all the worlds. He went through so much difficult, but he was able to give so much. How do I become a person who is on that prophetic orientation where I'm, I'm going through hardships and difficulties, but I'm so enriched and fortified by the beauty of revelation, by the beauty of Allah and his messenger وسلم, that now I'm able to give so much to people. Like really, I don't want anyone to accept for themselves and especially young people because there is this, there is this reality that's overtaking so many young people to say like, man, I'm just a failure. I'm just a loser. I'm never going to really amount. I, you know, I can barely get out of bed. I don't know. I just whatever. And that very defeatist, pessimistic orientation, that's not your nature as a youth. Like as a young person, your natural disposition is to do what? Is to be far more, <laughs> you know, uh, upbeat and present and engaged and, and, and pursuant and explore, exploratory in your disposition. And that's something that I want people to realize about themselves. And, and, and one thing that you have to understand is that nothing in this world, no, no pleasure, no joy, no substance, no money, no influence, no power, none of that is going to satiate you and bring you what you really need in your innermost self as a spiritual being other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? It is only Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who when, when embedded within the spiritual space of your heart that you will find to, you'll begin to actually flourish, right? So the first thing is definitely, you know, exploring what your relationship with Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam need to look like, what your relationship with the Quran and Sunnah need to look like. Second to that, it was without a doubt, and Sheikh Usama and Ustaz Zaid noted this, the relationships you have, the context of the life of the people that you surround yourself with, right? If the only people that I hang out with are people exactly like me, who are going exactly through what I'm going through, by the way, I'm just going to continue to go down this way, right? So I need to find people, you know, they may be family, they may be friends, they may be, you know, people outside of that space who, who I identify as people who can actually make me a better person, help me to have higher pursuits, make me feel that there are better activities, there's a healthier way to live, there's a healthier way to, to speak and to, to talk to myself and to what, what things should I actually be consuming, how much more should I actually be reading, 
Like, listen, I, I, I grew up, I didn't grow up being a reader at all. I mean, I did not like reading at all until, until probably I got into college or late high school college when I started to like realize how liberating reading is, right? And how, how much it brings your mind and it consumes you. And that's why, oh Allah, increase me in ilm. Because knowledge is power in so many ways. It liberates. That's why the seeker of knowledge is someone who is, who is arriving at the highest of spiritual stations. Because it gives you so much perspective on existence. And especially sacred knowledge. The knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah and the Seerah and the Prophet ﷺ and his characteristics, etc. So I, I would say through, through, through developing an intimate relationship with Allah and his messenger, through seeking knowledge, through having great relationships. These are some practical measures that can help you on your journey. Wallahu uh, a'lam. Zakallah khair, Maulana. I, you know, there was, uh, so I wanted to just highlight this. I hope everyone, you know, following along is also processing it the way that uh, I think we're attempting to present it. Um, you know, on one level, when you discuss this issue philosophically, um, uh, just choosing to give in to the narrative that's being socially peddled uh, is so flawed on many levels philosophically and, uh, and, and spiritually, philosophically and spiritually. And uh, when you come to investigate it on the social culture that surrounds it, the, relate, the ruling relating to it that we addressed earlier, we didn't go deep into you know, some of the negative things that are often associated with uh, marijuana consumption. Uh, but of course, those things are not going to be categorical. I, like, I remember someone coming to ask me questions. Well, you know, uh, people say that uh, uh, m marijuana consumption is linked with uh, batala and uh, um, uh, unemployment and, uh, you know, uh, uh, just being a general fa failure in life. Well, for me, it's actually helping me focus better and uh, I'm actually getting better grades and I'm so it's not going to be a categorical thing, but it's a consideration for Qiyan because it's not just about you. And we already mentioned that, you know, how um, the uh, thousands and tens of thousands of people that are so deeply impacted by the marijuana consumption uh, on a social level are considered when we consider the fiqhi ruling. And then, you know, if that doesn't apply to you, then the ultimate discussion going back to the essence of the drug itself the thc is going to apply to everyone and i i think that's that's how i understand this discussion is going you know please feel free to correct me or if i missed anything uh but you know i i would like to ask that question you know um what would you guys say is uh what we're concerned about in terms of the social things that are associated with marijuana things that really shouldn't be find a place in the life of the believer Um, so I think, I mean, I'll answer that question. I guess I'll, I'll also connect it back to the question that I had asked that Sheikh Yasser had answered. Um, you know, one thing that at least in, in my own life that I, I felt Islam taught me to do that nothing else that I was exposed to ever even tried to teach me to do, um, is to embrace the reality of, you know, difficulty in life, anxiety in life, concern in life and make it something productive. Um, like I, I think quite often, like when we have conversations around these type of substances and these type of activities, there's this idea that it's, it's the normal thing and the right thing to try and escape from these feelings and to try and escape from some of these problems. Um, but if that was the case and you'd spend your whole life running away from your own life, right? Because life naturally brings with it anxiety, it brings with it concerns, it brings with it fears, we're human beings, we don't know. Like we have a very limited knowledge of what, what we can control and what's out there. We don't know much of what's going to happen to us. And people, you can really work yourself up into a frenzy if you're always concerned about this stuff. But the natural disposition should not be, let me try to escape. And I feel like we've we've kind of already, and this goes back to Sheikh Zam's question, there has been an acceptance of that as the norm. Right, like at the end of the day, I just need time to escape everything. At the end of the week, I just need time to escape everything. But what, you know, one of the things that Islam has taught me that I don't think anything else has ever tried to teach me is that that's, that's not the way to go about this, right? You need to embrace that. 
That's going to be a part, that's a part of the dunya. It's a part of your life. And it's a part of how Allah created you in this life. And so you need to be able to embrace it, know how to handle it, and then know how to transform it into something very positive, right? And this is where it goes into issues of dhikr, right? Why do you engage in a regular, healthy, steady diet of dhikr? This is why the, the, all the philosophical perspectives we discussed today are so important. And we've discussed in other episodes about what is the point of life? What is the point of, you know, my existence here in life? It gives you a real purpose and direction. So yeah, I feel some anxiety, but at the end of the day, what I'm after is Allah and the Akhirah. So there's a way I'm supposed to handle this, right? And then there's the whole conversation around optimism in Islam that is so broad and so wonderful that it, it, it makes optimism a ibadah. Right, like it's it's a it's a it's a form of worship to be optimistic, specifically because I or not specifically one major benefit that I've gotten from that in my life is that it, it always has it has helped me to just embrace it. Okay, there's some anxiety, there's some concern, there's some fear, there's some worry, but you know what? I'm going to do the best I can. That's all Allah wants from me, and then I have all the optimism. Allah's going to give me whether I whether I know what's best for me or not. Yet Allah's going to give it to me, right? And so I. Like one of the, the primary or essential, I think, negatives that comes along with this conversation of marijuana is the idea that I have to escape or I have to get away or I have to take a break from my own reality. And I, I don't agree with that at all. And I think even these podcasters that people are listening to quite often when I've listened to them speak about this stuff, that's why they promote it. Like it gives you a break. It gives you this, this chance to go on like this other spiritual journey where you're not like bogged down by things. Right? But then the reality is that you never really growing as a person and you're never really learning how to overcome these emotions and how to grab them and utilize them for something positive and have them drive you towards something good instead you're just trying to get away from them long enough that you can you know recharge your battery for a few hours until they overpower you um yeah i, I don't know it's interesting while you were talking i was thinking that you know it, it is in many ways the absence of meaning you know if i don't have purpose and i don't have meaning and I'm trying to just get through these days. Yeah, it makes complete sense that I'm just like, I don't really know why or what or purpose or meaning. So I just, I just need to like, you know, relax because I, 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 this world is too, you know. And so yeah, a lot of these public personalities, they don't really have, you know, uh, they, they they're not embedded with. It's actually quite the contrary. You know, they have they, they promote atheism in a very real way and it, it, as if atheism is enlightenment as if, as if atheism is like you know where you find like you know pure objectivism and and then you know in that space yeah you got psychedelics and things that take you into different dimensions and you begin to see things and you begin to go whatever it's like well when you're embedded within uh, the space of divine revelation when you're embedded within the space of theocentricity, I mean, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything revolving around Allah jalla fi ula, and you're, you're involved within like following a prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is the last uh, uh, messenger and prophet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then meaning is fortified. Alhamdulillah, I don't need to, I don't need to explore the purpose and meaning of life. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already identified it for me and clarified it. And he's liberated. That's why people love Islam. That's when people enter into Islam, they love it in the fullest sense because it really does fulfill the idea of meaning. Now, whether me as an average Muslim, I've I've internalized that. Yeah, that's 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 that can be yeah very much in in question. Have I really understood the purpose of my religion? What it's supposed to mean for me? What it can do for me, um, uh, etc. How it can refine my my existence i mean going back to the statement of rabbi ibn amir you know when he says that we 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 came islam came to exit us from the the constriction the tightness of this world to the expansiveness of the afterlife then i begin to realize hold on there's a there's a much higher purpose there's something called the akhirah when allah woman arad al akhirata those who desire the akhirah and they walk the walk of the akhirah and that I can put this world in an ukhrabi orientation that this world is very quick and it's very fleeting and it doesn't really hold uh, water you know this this world is just it, it came into existence it's going to be uh, you know Allah's going to eviscerate it at some point and then we have the akhirah to exist within then when I start to broaden my conception of life and meaning and purpose it becomes far more conceivable that I can actually live a extremely productive and meaningful life because I've, because you know what, because I've, 
I've gotten over myself. You know, I think one of the biggest problems is, especially when I'm trying to find purpose and meaning and trying to make sense, I can't get over myself. I can't get over my thoughts, my feelings, my wants, my this. I just can't get over myself. We, we, Islam, Islam proactively shows us how to get over ourselves so that we're, we, we are, we are, we are light on our feet. You know, it's a very beautiful way of considering that verse. And the servants of Rahman are those who walk gently on earth. And if some ignoramus comes and says something stupid, salam, you know. You know, people may even characterize that discourse as being so. Like this, Ibadu Rahman, Allahi Mazaju. Yeah, Mazaj. He has someone who's like, who's like, you know, really just relaxed. Yeah, because Islam teaches you to be relaxed. It doesn't teach you to be uptight. You know, it doesn't teach you to be aggressive. It doesn't teach you to be constrained and whatever. And exactly as says Zaid noted. Islam doesn't, Islam teaches you not to fear emotions, not to fear, like, yeah, the modern world and a lot of modern philosophy has taught us to fear pain, right? And to pursue uh, joy, right? To, to pursue pleasure. So if pain is bad, pleasure is good. So everything that causes you pain, whether reading causes you pain, studying causes you pain, working out causes you pain, eating healthy causes you pain, uh, praying causes you pain, and stay away from pain, right? Um, but, 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 you know, pursue pleasure, pursue joy, whatever relaxes you, whatever eases you, just pursue that. You want to sit down, and play video games? Go ahead, enjoy yourself. No one should tell you not. By the way, it's a big industry now. It's becoming a multi-billion dollar industry. And there's a whole reality that's being now facilitated through uh, video game playing. And it's actually very good for the mind, right? So go ahead. Play, enjoy yourself. You know, you can explore different worlds. You can go in, you can be very thoughtful and productive. You can have a whole community, right? So here's an alternative world. Go ahead. You're just, you're, you're like, I'm, dri I'm driving myself into the ground by, by deleting myself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he breathed into us. His ruh, a ruh, ruhina, right? His spirit, jalla fi ula. So we have dignified the son of Adam. One of the reasons why these discourses in Islam and Sharia around substances that are psychedelic in nature and that inhibit the mind in some capacity is because our dignity lies in our apparatus of knowing, our capacity to know without inhibition, right? Allah, that's the whole point. Anything that comes into that purview to impact Allah, no, stay away from it because your point, your purpose is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sheikh Zam, did you want to add anything to that question that you asked? Um, no, I think you guys, mashallah, stated a lot of, I think it was some of the points were previously stated. I like the point about the, the escape uh, that you emphasized, uh, Ustaz Zaid and uh, uh, Mawlana and uh, Sheikh Yasser, uh, the points that he added. I, I, th I think I'm completely in line with that. Inshallah, we're, 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 we're pushing now like an hour and 40. And so, um, uh, the, the, as always, there's still questions uh, to be asked. And I think more that can be um, discussed. So I'll, I'll uh, but we'll, we'll wrap it up here, inshallah. Um, I will, uh, I'm also going to ask the audience, please. I mean, this, this conversation was spurred by a question. We've gotten several others that inshallah we'll get to in future episodes, but uh, we really do take your, um, your feedback and your responses very seriously. We do want this to remain an interactive program. We do want to engage with the community directly. We said it, I said it last week as well, like we are very focused on the, the communities that we're a part of. So um, we, we like having a deeper relationship with our audience than just, you know, you guys consuming and listening to us for a few hours um, and filing it away and forgetting about it, right? So the, the questions and the engagement, I think, help us make sure that we're actually growing uh, together. We're on this journey together. So please, you know, feel free to respond uh, to anything that you've heard today. If you have follow-up questions or you want to make some additional points, please bring them up um, and we'll do our best to address them in future episodes, inshallah. Um, so and Sheikh Osama, just a yeah. one last question. Is marijuana haram or halal? Haram. <laughs> 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 
فجزاكم الله خير وأند إن شاء الله with the asking Allah سبحانه وتعالى to accept it from us and to bless everyone إن شاء الله in their days and in their weeks um, and إن شاء الله we'll see you next time جزاكم الله خير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله